Hello everyone, <laughs> I'm Angela and welcome to my symposium, now live and today's <laughs> uh, birthday celebration I guess, even though my birthday was on the 28th of January, but uh, yeah, I thought that it would be a great idea to celebrate with you, answering your questions and um, yeah, anything that you'd like me to, to ask, academic wise of course, <laughs> let me see who who is here already? Uh, hi, Andrew. Hi, Eric. Um, hi, Eddie. Oh, hi, uh, the Order of Chaos, uh, Sandra. Hi, Blue Steel and Astro Gypsy. Oh, thank you, uh, Ariel Glories, uh, for the happy birthday. Uh, and hi, Mesai, 20 years. <laughs> Hi Joe. So please do keep in mind that um, in order for me to, since I know that of course you will be chatting with each other in the chat box as well, which is totally fine. Actually, I do encourage it as, as well. Hi Richard. Um, I encourage you to start your question with the, the word question in capital letters so that um, it is easier for me to spot a question as opposed to um, a chat message that uh, may be uh, referring to somebody else. So Eric says, I didn't know, uh, happy birthday. So yes, I am an Aquarian. <laughs> Yeah, they say that the age of the Aquarius has started. So. <laughs> Hi, Theodora. Glad you you came over. Hi, Chris, Rai, uh, Cremon, and uh, Sarah. And hi, Jesse. Congratulations on completing another trip around the sun. Yes. <laughs> yeah. The, the last one was quite an interesting one, but uh, not just for me, but for everybody else. Hi, Thomas. Oh, Teresa is here. <laughs> Teresa, we missed you yesterday. Yesterday we had um, a monthly chat with my, with my patrons. And uh, it's always nice to catch up with them. We had quite an interesting conversation. Um, Hi, Baiko. I don't know how to pronounce some of your usernames, guys. I hope I'm <laughs> doing a good job or a good enough job. Uh, hi, Lord Dalloway. Thanks for the happy birthday. It's nice to, to see a few of here. A few of you here. Oh, I can see that there is. Um, first question from um, Masai or Mesai, not sure. Um, so the question is, are you planning to do any more videos on Western shamanism, like on Castaneda and Harner? Um, yeah, do you think that there is an interest for that? <laughs> it seemed like those videos, you know, didn't cut as much attention as other ones. But yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, actually, it is something that I have studied thoroughly for my PhD, so I could talk about it for ages. Is there a particular aspect of uh, Western shamanism that you'd like me to address, Masai? Oh, thank you for for your uh, for your uh, gift, your birthday gift, uh, Richard. It's very nice of you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and yes, of course, <laughs> metalheads here and goth, goth and metalhead. The two can can be can coincide, even though some may disagree. But. <laughs> Uh, Thomas says, uh, also more sessions on crystals and stones would be great. Oh yeah, now that we have Sarah among us in the Inner Symposium, uh, she's a, a new patron. I'm not sure whether she's here in the chat, but uh, she she's very fascinating. She's doing a PhD and she specializes in that. So yeah, we definitely 
I should do a, a session or a solo video uh, on that. Any chance for uh, a Franz Bardon video? Initiation into Hermetics would be a great topic. Yeah, actually, Crimon, uh, that would be really interesting and also something that is not talked about as much. I think that Marco Passi, uh, the professor from Amsterdam, mentioned uh, him in the, um, in the interview on Crowley, but yeah, definitely. I have to admit that there are so many things that I'd like to cover in my videos. It's just that as my, um, as my patrons know, because we interact uh, on a daily basis, at the moment I'm like extremely overwhelmed uh, because the second semester at my university is pretty busy. So it's more difficult for me to uh, to do research for new topics. So for the next two months, uh, which will be the, the busiest, I will be sort of drawing from uh, research that I also use for my university lectures. Then after March, I will be, um, yeah, I will be tackling things that you guys really want me to, to cover because of course I, I, I love to be responsive to what you suggest and you know to make this a place that it is not just for me but for for all of us it's just that I need time guys I, I wish that the day was made of I don't know <laughs> double as the amount of hours that uh, that I have at my disposal so Helena says uh, oh, uh, Masai says, uh, I'm mostly interested in an academic look at the fathers of it, like those those two I mentioned. It's hard to find them anywhere. Uh, so do you mean like an, ac an academic outlook on the figures of Castaneda and Harner? Yeah, actually, yeah, that's an interesting one. I love to know that. Uh, Eric says, uh, maybe you can check this book, The Teachings of the Ong Kwan. Yes, uh, obviously that is a... But I guess maybe Masai wants to have an academic take. Uh, I, I imagine that since he's asking about these two authors, uh, maybe he knows uh, their books already, but uh, it, it may be difficult to find perhaps an academic take, especially when it comes to Castaneda. Um, you know, there he's a controversial figure. Harner is not as much controversial, really, because he um, he he doesn't have you know that kind of uh, he didn't have that sort of mystical aura <laughs> surrounding him. But uh, Castaneda, with what he has written uh, in his books or uh, novels, um, yeah, it, it's been debated wh whether. The, what he says in his novels actually happened or whether it was a, a, a fictional story. But yeah. Oh, thank you so much, Thomas, for, <laughs> for your donation. It really means a lot. Uh, so, Eduardo says, question, uh, I will repeat what I asked on Discord. Oh, hi, Justin. I see that Justin is here. Uh, Justin from uh, Justin Sledge from Esoterica. Hi, Justin. Um, Justin says, a question, kind of academic. Happy birthday. <laughs> uh, we've been uh, messaging uh, in the past few days. If you could meet and chat with a historical person in Western esotericism, who would it be? Why and what would you want to talk about? Hmm, that's a very good question, Justin. Um, off the top of my head, I'd say Aleister Crowley. Uh, but of course, I guess that my answer may vary depending on the, the time and, the, and, and my interests. I, I think that I, I would have also liked to meet Anton LaVey. Uh, I think that he's a very fascinating um, a very fascinating figure but yeah what I'd like to ask what I'd like to talk about with Crowley um, 
let me think. It's a difficult one, I guess, because I'd like to talk with him about lots and lots of things. I'd say I'd like to talk with him about magic and what he truly thinks that makes magic work and what is his view of of reality how can the reality that he sees allow uh, magic to to exist ontologically speaking if that makes sense but yeah that's a great question justin uh the chat has moved a bit uh, where was i at uh, so eduardo says um Uh, but do you know how? Uh, I think it was Plato. Yeah, I think uh, I, I saw it on um, on Discord in our inner symposium community. You asked about the idea of good as the ultimate thing. I was curious about what the word for good he used meant. Um, the idea of Plato, as you as you may be uh, familiar with. Plato had the idea that there is a world of ideal forms and there are these forms that sort of uh, act as molds for what we see in our daily reality. And so even when it comes to the idea of good, the idea of good is not what we would intend in a moral sense, like good as opposed to evil, but it is a molding category I don't want to get too Kantian with my terminology, but um, it was more like a way to mold everything that it is, that is sort of creative in reality. So all the um, uh, creative elements of reality stem from that first model, that first mold, which is uh, the idea of good. Mm. So, uh, El Shelb says, wow, even Justin Sledge is here. Yeah, Justin is a celebrity and he is my friend. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> He's a friend of the symposium as well. <laughs> but yeah, I really love uh, what Justin does on his, uh, on his channel. It's a pity that he gets hate from random people, but yeah. That's a different different topic for a different time. Um, let me see whether there are other questions. Um, is her birthday really today? Um, or is it the birthday of, of the channel? The birthday of the channel is the 11th of August. And because I opened the channel in 2019, so just over a year ago. But my birthday is on the 28th of January, so it was just a few days ago. But I decided to do it on Sunday because, um, well, I was working <laughs> on my birthday. And, uh, and also, I know that you guys uh, would be able to, to join in since it is a Sunday and not a, a weekday. Hi, James. Nice to see you in the chat. Uh, Ryan asks whether I, uh, I've ever been in the United States. Happy birthday to you, Angela. Uh, oh, yours was on the 29th, another Aquarian. Nice. <laughs> so, um, um, no, I've never been in the US. I was supposed to go to the United States this year. I was supposed to go in Boston. And actually, it would have been so nice because I would have met Andrew, Andrew from Religion uh, for Breakfast. Um, because there, there was a, um, uh, a conference, the conference of the American Academy of Religion that uh, was being held in Boston, at Boston University, which is where he got his PhD. Um, and I, I had to present there, and I did present there. But um, unfortunately, it was moved online as um, everything at the moment. So yeah, but otherwise I would have been in Boston. 
but yeah, hopefully I will manage to, I will be able to, to go to the US in the, in the near future. There are lots of conferences that I, that I get to speak at. Um, so yeah, like the American Academy of Religion is a, a very big one and one that it is well attended by scholars in religious studies across uh, sub subfields and I yeah I'd love to to go there in person <laughs> next time hopefully the madness will be over by then happy birthday is great learning from someone with a PhD on the esoteric I'd love to get uh, some homework and practice different magic what is the discord server the discord server is for my my patrons um, we have a, um, a private Discord server and uh, there's also a book club which is led by Andrew, <laughs> who's here, <laughs> Reitenmeyer. I never know how to pronounce his surname, but yeah, uh, he leads the, the book club and uh, yeah, I think that our community is pretty amazing and we are acquiring more, uh, more members who are extremely interesting um, Helena says she's really Aquarius dresses in a really different way and is really and is a really mental person mental <laughs> I might uh, yeah I am an, an, intello an intellectual person and definitely uh, I've always been different although i guess in the past i wanted to be different now i really don't care i just want to be me um, so if that means that i defeat a label okay and if i don't i i really don't don't mind the benefits of aging you become wiser um Hello, is psychic healing considered part of witchcraft? Have you already spoken about it or would you? Psychic healing, do you mean like pranotherapy? Uh, but yeah, I'd say that it would be considered as part of witchcraft. It's not, yeah, it is a, I, I guess, a genre, a subgenre in its own, but um, yeah. Yeah, I, that'd be, it'd be interesting to cover it on the channel. Oh, thank you, the, the game philosopher, for uh, the happy birthday. Nice, nice username, by the way. <laughs> Mike says, um, would you consider interviewing someone like uh, Lon Milo Duquette, who is in a lot of the ways the modern inheritor of Crowley's tradition? I am sure he would uh, have a, uh, an interesting perspective. Uh, Mike, I think it, that that's an interesting question. Um, as you might tell by looking back at my at my videos on the channel, I tend to interview academics only. So all the interviews that you see on my channel are to professors, basically professors and academic researchers, and that is kind of the theme of my channel to address these matters from an academic point of view because there are so many other channels that um, address witchcraft and historicism from a practitioner's point of view so I wanted to offer uh, as Justin does as well um, a, a different way of approaching this uh, different perspective but I have to admit that I have been thinking of interviewing practitioners as well but I have to think of a format which would still fit the academic theme of the channel, if that makes sense. Uh, it could be like a, a form of interview, like the ones that I carry out for my anthropological research, for example. But yeah, I, I need to find a format that might work um, and perhaps create, you know, a specific series just uh, for the interviews to practitioners so that I, I don't want people to get confused if you if that makes sense like I don't want people to think that all the interviews on my channel are to practitioners or um, so yeah I have to find a way to fit it into my theme but uh, it is definitely something that I'm thinking of and Long Milo Duquette would be 
a great person to, to interview for sure. So Andrew has a question. What book do you plan to uh, do you plan to or and or most want to write? Um, well, actually, in the past few weeks, I have um, I, I've been in contact with a few publishers, so there are a few books that I'm going to uh, write or edit in the um, in the next few years. One of these would be on the philosophy of magic, addressing different magical traditions and what is the underlying philosophy that they that they have that they underpin because I, like different different magical traditions have different philosophical underpinnings they are not all the same and they also fit into specific theoretical frameworks and they link to their time and their culture in very specific ways so I'd like to write a book on the philosophy of magic and also of course I will be publishing uh, my thesis, my dissertation as um, you say in the US, my PhD dissertation which is on the indigenous transcultural shamanism in Italy. But yeah, I guess I, I, I like, my childhood dream was to be a writer and then my adult dream was to be an academic. <laughs> it, I, of course, in both cases, I've always been interested in magic and in this field. So it's like, yeah, but being an academic means being a writer as well. Uh, but I, I'd also like to write a, a novel based on um, experiences that I've had in the past. That is another thing that I'd like to do in the future. Richard asks, if you could meet Lilith, what would be your number one question? Lilith, <laughs> wow, you really uh, go straight to the... <laughs> um, what would I ask for Lilith? Um, what do you think is the foundation of magic? And what would you consider to be good and evil? Do they exist and how, how do you conceptualize them? Mm, the Order of Chaos, Sandra, hi, <laughs> um, As academically speaking, is hermetic philosophy, specifically the teachings of the Kibalion, a left hand path practice philosophy? Or is it more akin to the middle way Buddhism or neither? That's a very good question. Um, I think I would place it in a genre on its own, I'd say. I wouldn't classify it as either or left or right hand path because I see that it has sort of elements of both categorizations and also as we were saying yesterday in uh, in our uh, patron <laughs> uh, chat um, you know usually you have people who talk about yeah the left those following the left hand path talk about the left hand path but those following the right hand path don't talk about it in in those terms and these are terms which are borrowed from tantrism so in that case you would hear more people from a right-hand path describing their path as such. So yeah, I guess in this case, the Hermetic philosophy uh, based on the Kipalion, I wouldn't say that uh, it is, um, yeah, not, neither of them. I'd say that it is sort of a, a genre in itself, so to speak, a subcategory in itself. Thank you, Richard, for your donation, and I'm happy you like you, you were satisfied by my answer. So, um, Ariel uh, 
Helena says you have to interview Ronald Hutton. I've heard he does he does not like to be interviewed by journalists. He does not trust them. I'm quite sure he would like to come here. Helena, I don't know if you're aware of this, but uh, Ronald Hutton was the external examiner of, of my doctorate. <laughs> and um, yeah, we are in very friendly terms now. Um, I know that he admires my work and that made me so happy because he's always been my academic god. And uh, I told him after the examination, after I knew the outcome of the examination, I was, you know, a complete adult and I cried <laughs> saying, oh, you are my academic god. But yeah, I think that he might accept. I'm sort of, I don't know. But yeah, I might ask him. It'd be great to, to have Ronald Hutton here. Um, uh, Ariel says, if you could meet the goddess Hecate, which actually in Greek would be Hecate, uh, I tend to be pedantic when it comes to Latin and ancient Greek, <laughs> sorry. Um, what three questions would you most like to ask her to Hecate? So. I would, uh, I would ask, what do you think we can learn the most from the darkness? What do you think is the essence of magic? And how do one find their own path? Nice question, anyway. <laughs> so, um, sorry, but uh, the, the chat moves quite quickly and I always have to move it back, move it back backwards. Jesse asks from a perennial philosophy, I, I guess that you meant to say perennial philosophy perspective, what is the most interesting pattern or correlation you have seen across different schools. Um, can you clarify a bit better what you mean by perennial philosophy? Uh, I know what perennial philosophy is, but this the concept that uh, all philosophies across history and across cultures underlie um, you know a, a similar a, the same basis there is a core that underlies all the philosophies and traditions across history and the perennial philosophy wants to find that core that's something that has always been there just concealed and uh, conveyed in different ways but yeah if you can clarify uh, or expand a bit more on your question um, that'd be great thank you because i couldn't quite get um, Eric asks, um, is there any papers that you have published in these past years a post as a postgraduate student and where can we find them? Eric, yes, I have published quite, well, I wouldn't say a lot, but uh, for a PhD student, uh, I have a decent amount of publications. Uh, most of them are on my academia.edu page and actually this is a, uh, a tip that I, that I like to give you guys generally speaking um, if you want to find free academic papers look on academia.edu or academia.edu or on researchgate because um, I, I'm not sure whether people know this I think that non-academics don't know this but we don't get paid for academic publications um, and usually scholars really like to would really like to make public uh, what they what they write and so um, it is possible legally speaking to upload the, um, the proofs uh, so it's like the the final version before 
the, the version before the final editing so basically the content is the same and you as the author can upload it freely on your platforms so as a consequence authors uh, academics really like to share their, their content because it's also important for us to get cited and put our work out there so that uh, other scholars can know what we have studied and perhaps they can connect with us to work together or you know all sorts of things so usually academics like to share their work and they usually do that on uh, academia.edu or researchgate so you find lots of free academic peer-reviewed material over there of course there are also non-academics that post their things which are not academic so maybe look out for that but um, yeah mo most people on academia.edu are um, proper you know academics researchers hi Joel um, question circling on birthdays and name days what do you think is the earliest culture that celebrated getting older every year? Oh, that's a very difficult question, Joel. I don't know. I have no idea. For some reason, Egypt popped into my mind, but I, I have no clue <laughs> whether that, that is founded in anything, really. <laughs> I'm not even sure whether Egyptians celebrated birthdays. Yeah, I'm sorry, but I, I really don't know. But that's a really good question. I have to try and find the answer to that and perhaps I will get back to you in a, uh, in our Discord patron community. Oh, hi, Hattie. Thank you very much for your donation. It's very sweet of you. And I also like to I always uh, like to see your comments on the videos. <laughs> I guess that for you is not Monday. It's not morning um, because you're you're in Ireland, aren't you? If I remember correctly. So. Oh, where was I? Uh, Eduardo says question. I really should have asked this before. Um, the, the Jenny interview, but is it sad how humans defeated the entities of the land in Celtic mythology? Is there other mythos where humanity manages to defeat God's spirits in similar fashion? Hmm. I'm not sure about Celtic mythology because that is not my specialism. Uh, that, that would be a question for Jenny, <laughs> as you also mentioned. Um, I, I'm not sure whether there is any, any tradition where humans defeat gods. Yeah, I do have actually a tradition where humans I wouldn't say they defeat gods, but they are considered of a higher status than gods, and that is Buddhism. Because in Buddhism you have the six realms of existence, and you will um, cyclically get reincarnated in each one. So you have, you know, three of the realms which are um, considered the hells, and the three higher, the three realms which are in the upper uh, wheel which are the um, you have the humans the semi-gods and the gods if i remember correctly and uh, whereas the other three realms are demonic realms so for buddhists the reincarnation as a human being is the is the best one that you can get because even though gods will live a happier, longer, and um, ple more pleasurable life, since they live so much pleasure and so much happiness, they will not, they don't have the chance to escape the cycle of reincarnations. Whereas human beings are in, according to Buddhists, 
in a special position so they are kind of a the, the special ones so to speak more special than gods because they are in a position where they can experience good good and evil they can experience suffering and happiness and having the contrast between the two being sort of you know in between um things they can they do realize the impermanence of everything whereas gods may get maybe more easily del deluded uh, more easily uh, fall into the illusion that uh, that happiness will last forever and then it will end and they will get reincarnated in uh, another realm whereas human beings can see the impermanence through suffering and how it um you know it moves from suffering to happiness so i guess that yeah in buddhism you do have the uh, human beings i wouldn't say they defeat gods but um yeah they are in a more special position in a better position so let me see whether there are other questions marcel gomez henrik bogdan and Christopher Giudice are two academics that are interesting. Yes, absolutely. Yes, I'd love to interview them. Mike C question. Uh, do you think that Leland was being sincere in the Vangelo or was it fabricated? My teacher was convinced it was authentic. Shall we open the Pandora box of <laughs> uh, the Stregeria tradition? Um, there is no evidence that there is any historical um, facts behind what, um, as a basis to what Leland uh, says. So it may be that he met. Um, dead woman but we don't have any evidence it's just a matter of believing in something that has no uh, evidence really to uphold it but that doesn't mean that um, I I'm kind of waiting to address the stregeria or the strega tradition um, because uh, of course I do understand that there are lots of Italian Americans for whom this tradition is really important and this tradition links them to their roots in Italy so I really I, I, I'm really respectful of that um, at the same time uh, I, I may run into uh, when there, there are claims of authenticity um, of authenticity of Italian authenticity but that is a topic that I guess I, I should address uh, in a more articulate manner <laughs> um, and with proper references perhaps in a specific video let me know if you uh, if I answered your question Mike Helena says um, have you ever used the Italian oracle Sibilla della Zingara yes Actually, it was a game that we used to play at my high school. Um, although, where I come from, uh, you know that uh, the Sibilla was from Kuma, which is, uh, I'm not sure whether you have an English translation for Kuma, but um, yeah, uh, according to the legend and to the myth, uh, the Sibyl, the Sibilla was from Kuma. And Kuma is pretty near where I come from. <laughs> I come from Naples, so it is in the surrounding area. And uh, yeah, there was a, a specific oracle, uh, which which was very interesting. I I'm pretty sure that most English speakers are not familiar with it because it's all based on words and rearranging um, parts of sentences together in a specific way according to a question it's very yeah it's it's quite peculiar i i don't think i've ever seen another oracle like that 
So you, you have a question and then the question becomes a set of numbers and then these numbers will link to pages of the C bill and they and you will find only like uh, two three words two three words here two three words there and two three words there and when you put them together they make sense <laughs> and it's kind of unbelievable i don't know if it is like a, an allow it was based on an elaborate algorithm uh, but yeah it was really interesting and it was a game we used to play when i was in high school uh, would you say the oldest practitioners of magic were from ancient Mesopotamia, Druids or what? Uh, Ryan, I think that um, as far back as we go, I think the human beings have always practiced some kind of magic. Maybe the question might be whether it is a traditional form of magic or whether it is a folk magic, which is not structured. So it's more about having a structured form of magic, a structured form of witchcraft or folk magic. But um, I, yeah, I believe that as, long, as far back as we can go, human beings have always practiced or, you know, engaged with some kind of magic or some form of magic. Um, let me see. So, question from, um, I, I guess, a Russian username that I can't pronounce. <laughs> question, are there any echoes in the Western Academy from Russian, yeah, Russian traditionalist circles? Alexander Dugit, I'm certainly butchering the pronunciations, but uh, actually, no, I haven't heard of them, but thank you very much for raising this because now I, I want to look into it more thank you I, I shall look them up uh, yes Ethan Doyle White could also be um, a, an interesting person to interview Helena uh, hi Theodore it was nice to see you yesterday uh, how is numerology connected with magic practices or is it just restricted to astrology? Uh, there are many ways in which numerology is connected to magic practices. You have the Gematria, which is connected to the Kabbalah and uh, with um, unorthodox, uh, unorthodox use of the Bible. And there is something that I will make a video on uh, in, the, in the coming future. So, yeah, definitely stay tuned for that. But yeah, numerology and more generically, the use of numbers as bearing specific symbologies is sort of ingrained in the practice of witchcraft and magic. So numbers do have, are not just numbers in witchcraft. Well, in witchcraft and in magic, everything is also something else. Um, and that's it, that is the symbology that uh, sort of connects all the mundane things, all the things that we think of as being banal, they become something more and something beyond in witchcraft and uh, numbers are no exception to that. Um, yeah, definitely I need to do a, a video on numerology. Thank you, Theodora. Uh, Astro Gypsy asks, can you recommend techniques or literary resources for developing more cognitive flexibility so as to transcend dogma in worldview for recognizing the assumptions of daily perception? Mm. I would say um, as for cognitive flexibility, I guess you, in academia we tend to call it critical analysis and uh, it may be useful for you to know this term because uh, it might help you find new sources online. 
but I'd say that in order to find, to acquire more critical analysis or flexibility, as you put it, um, it would be a good idea to try and always challenge your ideas and your opinions and try and find the rationale of underlying uh, the view of somebody that you totally disagree with. If you do that, that will be a very interesting philosophical exercise that will help you develop critical analysis. And also another thing is that you, when you read something, especially now online, always look up the sources, always look up the what are the sources, the, the books, the articles, and the quality of those sources, because not all sources are made equal. So I'd say that to develop critical analysis, try and get into the intellectual shoes of people that you totally disagree with, and always challenge what you read, challenge the pre-assumptions of what you think, Ask yourself, what are the premises of this belief? What are the premises of this understanding of the world, of this view, of this philosophy, of this concept that I hold? I think that always questioning your premises is also a good way to acquire uh, flexibility or critical analysis. Uh, Theodora, I would like to know more about uh, Ra and Isis. Uh, what are your thoughts about them in connection to magic? Well, Isis and Ra are very connected to magic, <laughs> definitely. Isis, um, I guess, even more. But um, yeah, my thoughts are there are that these uh, Neteru, the, the Egyptian gods, are are really related to magic. Um, as you know from my video on Heka, magic in Egypt and in the Egyptian culture was strongly related to the very creation of the world. It was just embedded in the fabric of reality. And so the gods as well, of course there are different families of gods in Egypt depending on tradition, time, uh, etc. But yeah, I'm thinking of actually interviewing um, a scholar who specializes in uh, in Egypt and Egyptian culture so that we can elaborate more on that uh, more specifically and as always as you know before doing an interview I will ask you my patrons because Theodora is a patron of mine um, whether you have any any questions for the interviewee so you will get the chance to um, to ask your, your own question to, to her. So Eric, uh, I know that we don't get paid. I'm currently doing my PhD. That is why I know I'm just in a different area. Oh, Eric, you do a PhD too. <laughs> so yeah, you definitely know. <laughs> Errol, one uh, question. Can you, can you tell us of a time where you felt like a sigil you made worked. <laughs> Rowan, as you may know, I, I, I don't share my personal beliefs and practices here on the channel. I, I tend to focus more on the academic study of, this, of these topics. I'm sorry. Christopher asks, do pagans, uh, do pagans use a different word for idol worship? or making idols. When I try to do research on the topic, the majority of what I can find is Christian content. Um, maybe because there is an idol worship in paganism, not in these terms. Can you please clarify more what you mean by idol worship so that uh, I can better understand how to address your question, Christopher? Jesse says, technically, aren't humans stronger than God in Christianity because they determine the outcome? 
that is a debate for Christian theologians. <laughs> Joyce has tanti auguri. Grazie. And here's my best friend Cipriano. <laughs> Ciao Cipri. I didn't know that, that about Buddhism. That's pretty cool. So humans are actually a bit wiser than the gods. Yeah. That's interesting, isn't it? And usually people also believe that there are no gods in Buddhism, but that massively depends on the tradition because Buddhism has lots of traditions. Well, of course, you have the, the three major schools, the Theravada, the Mahayana and the Vajrayana, but then even uh, under these three umbrellas, uh, under these three main uh, vehicles, you will still uh, find different traditions and they hold different beliefs. But yeah, there are gods in, um, in certain Buddhist traditions. Uh, Mike asks what about the idea that Leland himself was a practitioner because there are at least one tradition of Wicca in the USA that traced their lineage partially to him well yeah I, I don't think there's reason to doubt that Leland was a, was a practitioner can you do a video on Tantra? <laughs> Actually, we were talking today about Tantraism and I was recommending uh, a few sources to... I think it was Eric? Was it Eric? I get confused with the username. Uh, but um, yeah, I definitely have to make a video. I was wondering whether to do a live stream or a solo video. By the way, guys, one of the things that I'd like to ask you what format do you like the most? Do you like uh, more my solo videos uh, or do you like more like live stream lectures or interviews or would you prefer me to experiment with a different format? Is there you know a specific format that you that you prefer? I'd be really interested to know that. Let me see whether there are other questions. Question from Jesse. In Joseph Campbell's video lectures, the references he references a common thread of the river being referenced as a source of life across many different belief systems. Have you ever seen a common thread? like this across magic practitioners best clarification i could i could do lol jesse uh joseph campbell is one of those uh, scholars like uh, michel yade and others from the 20th century which are now a bit outdated and more uh, more updated scholarship um, it's not quite in agreement with um, specific claims that these scholars um, made, even though they have been quite influential, like Mircea Liade is still extremely influential in shamanism and Joseph Campbell is, has been and is still being, he's still quite influential when it comes to mythology, but they share a common issue which is something that you culturally find a, a lot in the 20th century, especially yeah, around the 1950s or so. You do have this common trend that they wanted to find similarities across cultures. They, they wanted to find something which was um, sort of true everywhere and uh, across ages and across time and across places. And this is something that 
um, was also mirrored in magic traditions because, uh, as you know, you have transcultural shamanism and you have many other claims in magic traditions that there is there are specific truths which go beyond uh, locations and go beyond. There is this kind of universalization, universalization on one end, so the idea that certain principles are applicable to everyone living everywhere, and at the same time the idea that there are core principles, core truths that you can find regardless of, uh, of these specifics. But now scholars agree that this is not really the case because um, you can, of course, find similarities, but then when you say that similarities are the same thing, you are uh, running into a logical fallacy, which is called oversimplification. And uh, when you oversimplify too much, you, you lose lots of nuances that that specific context, that specific concept, in that specific context had. So context is important, actually, and it does change how we think. Even things that resemble each other, they are never quite the same um, when they are practiced by specific people in a specific time and in a specific place. So let me see whether there are other questions. Uh, Theodora says, I really enjoy the scripted videos more. Uh, I would say keep exploring both uh, or all three. The live streams are really good because it's more interactive. I like both video formats, the short videos for introducing a subject for and the longer videos to know more about a video that I already know. Yeah, and that could be an idea actually. Uh, you could release shortcuts of your live streams, interviews in your channel. Variety is the spice of life, as they say. <laughs> nice, I can see that there is a, a consensus here <laughs> that you like a variety. And, uh, you know, as an Aquarian, I also, <laughs> I also like variety and to change a lot. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. I do prefer having multiple formats so that, because of course, you know, it kind of also affects the way the information is conveyed because different formats have you know benefits and also issues like everything in life i guess jesse says i'm i'm glad i'm here to learn oh thank you i'm also glad that you're here jesse Uh, where are you from? I'm from Italy, but I live in the UK now. I live and work in the UK. Vidar or Vidar <laughs> says happy birthday and happy unbirthday, everyone. <laughs> That's a good point. I see I am late to the party about the, the topic of idols. It is usually not the idols themselves that are being worshipped. Yeah, that's a good point, Vider. Um, maybe that's why Christopher can't find anything specific about idol worship in paganism because it's not really. I'd say that I'm not even sure I would call it worship because more often pagans talk about working with demon, demons, working with deities uh, rather than worshipping deities or gods or goddesses. It's more, there's more the idea of working with these entities rather than worshipping these entities. Mm. Of course, there is also a component of worship and there are something, there are lots of ex exceptions in paganism, but um, 
I'd say that in paganism is more a relationship rather than um, you know a, a vertical worship. I'm really happy to see all of you here, guys. Yeah, it was really fun to, to be here with you guys. You know that um, these are quite difficult times for everyone and so it's nice to interact with you um, because you know when I film my videos it's just me and the camera whereas here I can um, I, I can see that you are well of course even reading your comments and replying to your comments I get an interaction with you but the live stream bring it, brings it to you know a different level Eric asks, in your knowledge, maybe there might not be a lot of relationship, but uh, is there any relationship between the Sephiroth and the Yggdrasil? Um, they are, I think they are related to different cultures and different traditions. Uh, they have been associated because of the symbology of the tree, but as I mentioned when talking about Joseph Campbell, I, I as most scholars, if not all scholars that I know, uh, now emphasize the importance of contextualizing in order to understand things better. So I wouldn't associate things which are not, which don't have a strong cultural or traditional link at least when we are trying to, I'm not saying that I'm against, against syncretism, by the way. I'm just saying that when we are trying to understand things from an academic point of view, we need to be very specific and really see things in their context and in relation to the, the culture that birthed them. Uh, Andrew says, a format I liked was the panel discussion. The one on concepts on the afterlife. Mm, I love that. Perhaps uh, that is a, a way to introduce practitioners as as a part of the mix. Yeah, actually that'd be nice, like a symposium of academics with practitioners. Might be complicated to <laughs> to to organize, but. Uh, Jay Lim says, I found you through your collaboration with Religion for Breakfast. Are the plans to collaborate with other YouTubers with similar and complementary interests? Uh, yeah, I'd like to... Um, we've been talking of collaborating with um, Let's Talk Religions for quite some time, but um, haven't yet arranged, arranged anything. And also, I'd like to collaborate with the modern hermeticist. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm open to collaborations. To be honest, uh, I like to collaborate with people. <laughs> Once again, an Aquarian feature. Lady Ketera Ank said us in the pyramid text of. Unas, it appears certain texts are speaking of cannibalism. Mm. I don't see the question, but um, that wouldn't surprise me, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, Sarah says, uh, no other connections, however. I understand keeping things to their cultures, however, if you are going to quote using Joseph Campbell, he understands universal archetypes and recognizes word. Yeah, as I said, mm, I think that it is interesting to use archetypes as a as a way of understanding the world and cultural phenomena, as long as you don't lose 
the the specifics in an effort to make all things resemble each other and to find something which is you know universal and cross-cultural I think that archetypes can be useful as a as a tool and even as a methodology as long as they are flanked by uh, a more a narrower and more contextualized view but that is from an academic point of view as i said i'm not speaking um in terms of practice so in terms of practice that there would be different i guess <laughs> Eduardo says, uh, how, how do you think religious studies will evolve in academic terms? What practical uses do you think it could have in the future? Also, it was me who asked about Tantra. <laughs> Sorry, Eduardo. Um, you should use your, your name on these cards so that I can remember uh, better. Who asks what? <laughs> but uh, what few? What do I think religious studies will evolve in in academic terms? I think that religious studies is getting more and more interested in different forms of religiosity, like for example, even invented religions and um, new religious movements and magic practicing traditions. I think that it will evolve in a way that it might help the general public understand and offer a view of religion which is not dogmatic and does, doesn't have to resemble a monotheistic religion. Mm. Versa says Happy born day, fan of anime. Uh, it was it was shows like Outlaw Star, Witch Hunter, Robin, and such that were filled with these esoteric ideas uh, that played a big influence on my thinking as a kid. Yeah, I also love anime, so I totally I can totally relate with that. Whale Olapo says, uh, for a beginner, what is the right path to learning magic? Um, well, I, we here talk about the academic study of magic rather than how to learn magic. Um, although in my inner symposium, um, there are practitioners who talk about that a bit more, about uh, the, the practice uh, alongside the academic side of it. But uh, as for me, as a, as a scholar, I, I, I stick to talking about the academic study of magic. So Sandra asks, would you ever consider doing an academic study of the tarot and or astrology? Yeah, that would be really interesting. Like a, a specific paper, but that would need to be narrowed down in a way that it can be methodologically feasible for an academic paper. Um, but yeah, that, that would be interesting. I think that there must be something uh, academic on, on the topic. I have to, on, on these two topics, I have to search for it. But yeah, thanks for asking. That, that was an interesting question. Well, I guess that we can wrap up the live stream now. It is it was really in, I, I really love to interact with you guys as always and um, yeah I'm so happy that you that you came over to <laughs> um, to these question and answers and to uh, sort of celebrate my my birthday in these very isolating times but uh, yeah thank you thank you so much thank you so much for coming it, it really means a lot to me your support, the fact that you like and subscribe to my channel, your comments, every little thing that uh, helps our channel grow and 
uh, and helps me and helps me make a point that the academic study of magic matters really helps me helps me as in in my project to you know divulge this uh, the subject matter and also helps the academic community to acknowledge that there is in fact an interest in us uh, keep studying this uh, this subject area so thank you so much and uh, I, I really hope to interact with you guys soon um, there is Lela who's asking a question uh, what do you recommend to someone who loves the academic study of the occult but can't pursue a degree at the moment I love ancient philosophy um, Lela <sighs> follow channels of people who address this matter from an academic point of view, I guess. Or uh, if you want to pursue it from as an academic, perhaps finding funding or a scholarship might help if you cannot afford to pursue that. Or just study it yourself, basing, it, basing your knowledge on peer-reviewed literature and proper reputable academic scholarship so yeah thank you so much guys for coming over and thanks to my patrons and uh, all of you who kindly donated to to the project I actually need to buy a new microphone for uh, for my uh, for my videos because the one I had decided to break down and fall apart well it didn't fall apart physically but it, it doesn't work anymore so thank you so much for for coming here guys and thanks for all the nice birthday wishes and uh yeah i hope to see you guys in the comment section of the next video which i can already anticipate and it will be an interview and it will talk about invented religions and provisional beliefs. It's going to be really, really fun. Well, academic fun. <laughs> Don't forget to like and uh, leave a comment uh, below. If, if there are any questions that I didn't manage to answer, please, please leave them in the comment section. And as always, I will be replying to them. And if you're watching this at a later date, Hi, thank you for, uh, you know, reaching the end of this very long live stream. And um, yeah, let me know in the comment what you, what you thought of it. And stay tuned, as always, for all the academic fun. Bye for now.